Welcome to the Worship of God with Northside Drive Baptist Church on this 15th day of November, and Thanksgiving is right around the corner. For those of you who are planning uh, travel plans this year, maybe deciding whether to be with family, it's very difficult because of the rising COVID numbers. We're learning more and more in these days how to live with ambiguity. The ambiguity of not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow. The ambiguity of not knowing how to balance risk. This is something we're getting good at. I had to grab my notes. But Paul's letter to the Thessalonians that you'll hear read in a moment, it teaches us to keep awake in these days of ambiguous living. For God has destined us not for wrath, but to obtain salvation. It may feel like this year, 2020, has been a year of wrath, but the truth is that it's God's desire that the whole world obtain salvation. So when it feels like angry, wrathful days, remember, God can redeem even the worst of situations. I hope that word brings you peace and comfort today during the service and, and through this week. Already today you've heard beautiful music by Melinda. She played three hymns. One was that wonderful, well-known hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be, Consecrated Lord to Thee. And I love how the rest of that stanza goes. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in endless praise. Wouldn't that be great if we could let the anxiousness and despair of our days uh, be converted into praise? We'll hear from Steve Sheely, who will play on the dulcimer, Be Thou My Vision. And James will be preaching on the Thessalonians passage uh, about uh, the seasons and times of life. Following the benediction today, you'll hear a special message from one of our members, Theresa Manley, and our missions partners, CBF Field Personnel in Japan, Laura and Carson Fushi. And they will be giving us some testimony as part of our pledge campaign for the 2021 budget. Let's prepare ourselves for a time of prayer. Welcome back. Would you pray with me? Lord, for these moments and for these days, to you we give our deepest praise. For the family we have who love and cherish us, God, we give you thanks. For this church community that is committed to following Jesus, we give you thanks. For James, our senior pastor, who has faithfully served 23 years and is living out his final two months with us with deep gratitude, we give you thanks. Hear our gratitude, and as we speak, help us to seek each day moments of gratitude and grace. Lord, it's November and the coronavirus seems like it's worse than ever. But last week we heard the news that a vaccine might be on the way. And so, God, we grasp them to that with great hope. Be with the scientists and doctors who are working around the clock on this. Be with those entrusted with decision-making about how to administer the vaccine. And God, be with us, fearful souls that we are, as we await the future. But Lord, as we wait, help us to be wise stewards of our time right now. Redeem our time convert our wayward energy, redirect our anxiety and distress, resurrect our tired bodies and souls through Christ our Lord, who teaches his disciples how to pray the Lord's Prayer that we'll say together now, saying boldly, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, my Northside Drive family. I certainly do miss seeing each and every one of you face to face. I know that we've had some trying times in this pandemic, but I hope last week brought you a little bit of joy, and I hope you find joy in the weeks to come. This morning, I'm here to read from the 123rd Psalm. To you, I lift up my eyes. O oh, you who are enthroned in the heavens, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid looks to the hands of her mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. Have mercy upon us, for we have had more than enough of contempt. Our soul has had more than its fill of scorn of those who are at ease of the contempt of the proud. Have a wonderful week. The scripture passage that James will be preaching from in just a moment is taken from the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians, chapter 5, and it's verses 1 through 11 that I'll be reading now. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us fall let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. 
Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. Thanks be to God. You've heard Daniel read the text from one of Paul's letters called 1 Thessalonians. And it turns out that this may have been the earliest letter he wrote. And if that's true, that means that at least among the letters of Paul that uh, have come to us in our Bible, this is the earliest piece of Christian literature that we have. That's an amazing thing to me. It was written before the Gospels. It was written before uh, Romans and 1 and, uh, uh, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, all these things. But here's this little bitty church in Thessalonica that maybe about 20 years after Jesus uh, died and was raised came into being. And this is one of the earliest pieces of literature. And Paul, in this text that you heard Daniel read, talks to them about time. I've been thinking about that. COVID has changed how we all see time. COVID has changed how we see time. I mean, ask any parent who has school-age kids at home, and if the parent works at home and the kids are in school at home and everybody's on a computer and the internet crashes, it'll change how you view time. Ask a teacher, has COVID changed? You and she or he will say yes, because of how much more demanding life is now. There's not work and home, there is all work together. Or if you run a business and every year you take a, uh, the office uh, retreat where you uh, go put up the whiteboard and say, now let's talk about our five-year plan or our strategic plan. Uh, no, that's almost off the table now. That five weeks is long range planning. Uh, what we would say is the best laid plans of mice and men. COVID has changed how we think about time and thus how we think about our lives. Now, COVID didn't happen to the Apostle Paul, but he said some words that made me think of that. The Apostle Paul wrote these early Christians while he was a new Christian and they were new Christians, and he talked to them about time. The phrase goes, I want to speak to you about the times and the seasons, he said, the times and the seasons. So let's think about that too. As you and I pass through the seasons of life, how shall we live in the time we have? As you and I pass through the seasons of life, how do we live well and faithfully in the time we have? Now, of course, you would guess why I would be thinking about that, because I'm at a, on the cusp of a new season in my life that is both invigorating and fearful for me as I approach retirement. It'll be a time of pondering for me this season and time for the church as well, and your life as well as you go through these seasons and times, through griefs and gratitudes. But what I'm observing is that life, life, life streams past us, and we don't notice what's coming by until we stop and pause and ponder. And it's something like a pastor that's been here for 23 years and then preparing to leave that that almost by proxy pauses the congregation. We get to look around and see what's happened and those that have come and those that have gone. And it helps us see life from the panoramic perspective. As I've been pondering this season and these times, I taught of, thought of two things that came uh, to me from this text. The first thing, as Paul speaks to them about the times and the season, he reminds them, and thus us, that to, we need to focus on what matters most, not just on what matters. Focus on what matters most. I often say that in the gathering time, back before COVID, that we come to church not just to talk about what matters, but about what matters most. There's a lot that matters in our lives, in our daily routines and activities. But when we come to church, when we're able to come to church, we think about what matters most. Paul, in addressing this congregation, talked to them about their various theologies that were 
uh, uh, asking questions of them, their eschatology, uh, how will the end times come, when will the day of the Lord be? They ask all these questions, and uh, he, he answered some of them. But I like how he came back to the basics. He didn't spend a lot of time arguing theology, but he said, as you go out each day, that's my paraphrase, put on the helmet, put on the breastplate, and the helmet would be of hope, and the breastplate would be of faith and love. He came back to that later in life as he told the Corinthian church, now abideth faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. To me, that's going back to the basics of relationship, not to the details of theology. An argument that could separate one from the other, but he came, he brought them back to home base. Over these 23 years, I think about the losses we've had, the times of funerals, the times of memorial service. It occurred to me that one of the differences that I see between an obituary and a eulogy, eulogy being in one of these services, is that sometimes an obituary can read like a curriculum vitae. Attended these schools, got these degrees, started these businesses, worked in, in these uh, uh, situations in his life. It, all important things. But in a eulogy time, it's often that which grabs the heart of the congregation when the eulogist says, you know, the grandchildren told me that whenever they would skin their knee, that grandpa would always sit them on his knee and tell a story. And by the time the story ended, their tears had stopped. Or, you know, Jane worked her way up the ladder in the company, but Though she was the boss, she treated all of us like colleagues, and she really cared about our lives. You hear that? It's about the relationships we have. Or, to use Paul's word, maybe this person lived a faithful life and treated us friends and always told us, do not give up hope. And whenever he smiled, it always had plenty of love. Faith, love, and uh, hope. We're in this together, aren't we? And so, whatever it means to attend to the season of your life right now and move through your life in time right now, focus on what matters most. Here's the second thing. You already have what you need. Or said a different way, all you need, you really already have. I love it how Paul started this phrase as in, I could be writing to you, brothers and sisters, about the seasons and the times. But then he says, but you already know these things, so I don't need to write them. And then like most preachers, he goes on ahead and addresses them, <laughs> writes them, uh, says a little bit more, but he could have stopped there. You already know everything you need to know. And then that's when he starts echoing what matters most. You already have what you already need. Now, we can spend a lot of our lives uh, frantically acquiring things. And then once we acquire them, the franticness doesn't stop, doesn't it? It's taken over by obsessive uh, controlling and obsessive uh, uh, keeping and, and holding on to the things, retaining the things we have. Jesus said, don't do that. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Look over there at the lilies. Uh, they don't toil or spin, but look, they have beautiful raiment. So don't worry about that. Look over at the birds. They don't plant food, harvest food, but somehow God gives them enough food that they have all they need. And God promises that to you and me. Part of it is how Paul ends this, this phrase, into the text that Daniel read. Paul says, encourage one another and build one another up. Encourage one another, build one another up. I think Paul was trying to say, we are in this together. And part of the reason that we have everything we need is that God gives it to us congregationally as we share and as we give to the world. He also says in this text, stay awake, be awake. In, in our conversations now, we would say, be woke, W-O-K-E. 
that to live a life that's woke. There are some that see that and use that derogatorily. I don't. I think it's important. I think it happened to me this year among all the, uh, the racial uh, issues that have come to mind that we've been talking about in our congregation, something in me woke. And I saw that more clearly of how racism gets into our judicial system or law enforcement system or educational system, congregational and, and religious systems. And it becomes so a part of the water that you, that we as fish, in particular white fish, don't even see it anymore. But once you are woke, then stay awakened to this. And it's hard to do. I read an article this week that the white church is starting to go to sleep again because it's hard to remain woke watching and going, well, you know, there's just a little, so much we can do. And, you know, it's been around for so long and we have so many needs right in front of our face. After all, we've got to meet the budget, you know. So there are always plenty of things that are important and that matter. But again, what matters most? So I think from this text I hear, part of why we have everything we need is because we're part of a congregation that has resources of faith, of hope, of love, and of caregiving uh, for one another to help us stay woke. I'm so proud of our social justice book club as they continue to read and continue to work on their lives. Here's what I want to close with, it's a story that happened to me years ago, my first sabbatical, 2005. Um, at a season in my life, a strategic season, I uh, first went to Zimbabwe. And I remember the place in Gweru, Zimbabwe, out in the edge of the bush, where I was sitting one day reading a book. And it was a book about pilgrimage and how the soul comes alive on pilgrimage. I read an article in that book, a compilation by William Elliot, a writer. And that the story he wrote goes like this. He wanted to go interview Mother Teresa in Calcutta, India. And he made the travel all the way there to go meet her. He gets to Calcutta and you can imagine all the, the social and institutional and transportational language, all the various things you have to get through to get there to Mother Ter Teresa. And so he gets there. She's in a prayer service. He's in the prayer service. He said I, I, he was struck by how small she was, a very tiny woman. And then when she moved, she did great things for God. She was a saint. However, she just took one step at a time and another step at another step. And maybe that's how you do great things for God. One little small step and action at a time. Anyway, uh, William Elliot went up to her afterward, introduced himself, and said, I'm here to interview you, Mother Teresa. Whereupon she throws up her hands and says, I don't give interviews, no more interviews, and turned to walk away. Well, he just couldn't believe it. He'd come all this way, and he then held up a letter and said, but Mother Teresa, this letter is from you. You confirmed that I could give you, uh, that I could have an interview with you. And she sighed and she said, put the letter down, takes her two small hands and takes his one hand. And she says, I'm tired and I need some rest. I'm not feeling well and then turned to walk away. Now, the writer, William Elliot said, it was almost like God saying to me, you are going to die right now. Because he, had, he was writing a book about these stories and he needed this story and she was saying no. But she turns to walk away, but then turns back to him and says, you have many gifts. Do something for the glory of God and for the good of people. And always let the joy of God's love burn in your heart. And then she lifted a hand to wave goodbye and walked away. Now he said that he heard in her hand, go on now, 
uh, you're going to be okay and you have everything you need. It's true for you too. As you go one more week into COVID and one more week toward Advent that's around the corner, let us go on now. Consider what matters most. You have everything you need and whatever season of life you're in or time you're going through, God is there with you. Remember that on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. Amen. As we prepare to go, especially toward the season of Thanksgiving, we are grateful. Um, and I think it's in the Bible somewhere that that word in Hebrew is wow. Wow, Steve Sheely, that was great. We're grateful for you and grateful for grace and grateful for vision. So as you go in peace, remember this. May the strength of Christ uplift you, the comfort of the Holy Spirit surround you, and the grace and mercy of God give you hope and give you courage, for you have everything you need as we go in peace. Amen. I'm Joe Meeks, the current moderator of Northside Drive Baptist Church. We'll be soon kicking off our 2021 Pledge Drive, and this week you'll be hearing from our current mission partners and a member of our church about the reasons you should support that drive. I encourage you to do so. Hello, Northside Drivers. This is Daniel Hedrick, Associate Pastor, and I'm joined by Theresa Manley, and we are delighted to have you with us. This is our pledge campaign, and um, I'd love to hear from you, Theresa, about how um, our ministry during COVID has impacted you and maybe other words that you might have for us. So welcome and 
you have the floor. Thank you for asking me. Um, Northside Drive is very active in missions and we've all experienced that in our time of need. There's the Tolliver County, there is the Habitat, there is the Prayer Shell Group, but the ones that each of us really understand are, the, are how it affects us in our time of need. Now when we can't be together because of COVID, we have the Zoom meetings when we can see and talk with each other. The Wednesday morning prayer meeting, the Thursday evening book club, the Saturday prayer meeting, the occasional diaconate meeting, other times that we can see each other and talk. And then we get to see the recorded Sunday morning services, which we can see and hear the ministers and the music. All Saints Day, the church was set up perfectly for what's going on now. And that was a group of volunteers who knew what they were doing and set up the church beautifully. This is a part of the ministry. This ministry is important to me and I am sure it's also important to you. Other more personal ministries happen every day. James and Daniel and the deacons are available to talk and support in your personal need. Personal example for me, when my brother John died not too long ago, James and Daniel came all the way out here to Loganville and met with my family to do an in-home funeral service for my brother. That was extremely meaningful to me and to the rest of the family and I thank them very much. One example of personal ministry here. Our church has adopted a budget for next year. It's our responsibility to support that by our giving regularly. And this is what a pledge is, our personal promise to support our church and its missions by giving what we can regularly. That's what a pledge is. Thank you so much for your testimony and uh, for your, your ministry through the diaconate and beyond. Um, I'm grateful for you and the words you said. Thank you. All right. Hi, I'm Geneva Hall Shelton and a member of our church's missions committee. We thought it was important to show you how through our church's financial contributions, we are able to invest in critical missions both here and around the world. A shining example of this work supported by our church is that of Laura and Carson Fushi, who have been serving in the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship and putting their faith into action in Japan for the last seven years. They're both McAfee graduates and Laura herself is a former member of Northside Drive Baptist Church. And we're thrilled to support their inspiring work through our church's tithing. Here they are now to share more. Good morning, friends at Northside Drive. We are Laura and Carson Fushi, Cooperative Baptist Fellowship Field Personnel to Japan. We're also graduates of McAfee School of Theology, and I'm a former member of Northside Drive. Uh, Northside Drive ordained me to the ministry, and it was also where we were married. So Northside Drive certainly holds a special place in our hearts. We were with you uh, almost exactly a year ago, uh, and we're visiting CBF uh, partner churches and friends across the Southeast, and we're uh, planning to return to Japan in March when the pandemic really got bad, and we decided to delay our return. Travel restrictions have kept us here until now, um, but this time has given us a unique opportunity to kind of further our ministry here in the United States, even as we're away from our home in Tokyo. Uh, we've had the opportunity to connect more deeply with the Japanese Baptist Church of Raleigh. Uh, we've continued our Japanese language lessons, and we've uh, had conversations um, through online communication with our partners in Japan, the Japan Baptist Convention. 
Uh, the good news is that Japan has lifted travel uh, restrictions for new visa applications, so we are in the paperwork process for that and ask for your prayers uh, as we continue with that. This year has not been like any other, and as we've all had to adapt to a new normal, um, support for us uh, through churches like Northside Drive um, has helped us during a time where we've had to pivot and try to do ministry alongside our Japanese partners from the United States. Um, your support has given us encouragement and stability during this time. Um, and as you begin to make and discern your pledge contributions to the Northside Drive budget for this year, um, know that part of your pledge goes to support field personnel like us through the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. Um, you support our presence where we are located around the world um, and that you offer that stability for us to be able to do ministry near and far. We are thankful for your continued support, and we are proud to call you partners in ministry. Thank you. Thank you.